So I introduce him now ahead of the presentations by our four 2022 Royal Society of New South Wales scholarship winners. So I welcome them. I welcome Fred Osman, uh, one of our moderators, who is the uh, president of the Teachers Guild of New South Wales, and also welcome Professor Stephen Weller, who is uh, Professor of Electrical Engineering at the University of Newcastle. So I will hand over to Fred. Thank you for the warm welcome and very nice joining everyone this evening for the Society's Jack Kelly Award and the Royal Society of New South Wales Scholarships for 2022. Dr. Susan Pond, the Royal Society of New South Wales President, fellows and members of the Royal Society of New South Wales and distinguished guests joining us this evening for our 2022 Student Award presentations. For the past 13 years, the Australian Institute of Physics and the Royal Society of New South Wales has named a separate award category within the Australian Institute of Physics Postgrad Awards event called the Jack Kelly Award. The Jack Kelly Award was created in honour of Professor Jack Kelly, 1928 to 2012, who was the head of physics at the University of New South Wales from 1985 to 1989, was made an honorary professor of University of Sydney in 2004, and was president of Royal Society of New South Wales in 2005 and 2006. Professor Jack Kelly was appointed as an inaugural fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales for his work of international stature in applied physics and for his contribution to science generally and to the Royal Society of New South Wales in particular. The Jack Kelly Award was created to encourage excellence in postgraduate research in physics. It is supported by the Royal Society of New South Wales and the Australian Institute of Physics. The winner is selected each year from a short list of candidates who have made presentations at the Australian Institute of Physics Postgraduate Awards event where candidates are judged on the criteria. One, content and scientific quality. Two, clarity. And three, presentation skills. The Australian Institute of Physics and the Royal Society of New South Wales has been honoured to award the Jack Kelly Award each year. And we are delighted to have this award presented to encourage excellence in physics as an important funded prize by the society. To recognise outstanding achievements by an early career individual working in a physics related field. We'd like to congratulate on this occasion, Mr. Shankar Dutt, PhD candidate from the Australian National University, who was selected as the 2022 Jack Kelly Award winner for his presentation, Sensing One Molecule at a Time, a Pathway to Personalised Healthcare and Early Detection of Alzheimer's and MS. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Shankar from Research School of Physics at Australian National University and I will be presenting some of the work on sensing one molecule at a time, a pathway to personalized healthcare and early detection of Alzheimer's and MS. So let's first discuss what's the motivation behind my research. So approximately 472,000 Australians are affected by neurodegenerative diseases. These neurodegenerative diseases are very important so that they can be detected earlier in their course because if they are detected earlier uh, methods or through medicine they can be slowed down but this early detection is not achievable by traditional diagnostic techniques and the traditional diagnostic techniques for testing and detection they use invasive tests for example spinal tap where uh, fluid is taken directly from the spine of the patient or the PET scan, which is expensive and have long waiting periods. So my research is to combine physics as well as artificial intelligence to develop a novel nanopore sensor that allows label-free detection of biomolecules in complex solutions. So the aim of the research is to develop a sensor that provides almost real-time results. I'll go through all the steps of how we develop the sensors now. So for understanding how nanopore sensor works, we need to understand what nanopores are. 
So as the name suggests, nano ore. So it is a hole with whose at least one dimension is in nanoscale regime. So nanopores are in our body. So they are biological nanopores. They are pre present in the cells of our body, which allows the transfer of different, different products through uh, the cells. So the advantage of biological nanopores are that they are easy to synthesize. They're very reproducible and have very, very defined shape and size. Here you can see an example of a single standard DNA running through a biological nanopore. But they have a lot of disadvantages because they are biological systems. So they are sensitive to pH, temperature, stress, salt concentration, everything. They are not thermally, mechanically or chemically robust. And we cannot change the shape or size of the pore. On the other hand, solid state or artificial uh, nanopores have some advantages over biological nanopores, such as they are completely stable. They can be used in different, different environments, uh, either be pH, uh, salt concentration. They can be used at different, different temperatures and have long shelf life. Further, we can use these solid state nanopores to study and mimic the fundamental biological processes. But the disadvantage of these solid state nanopores is to they are very difficult to fabricate and very difficult to control the shape and size of these nanopores. So I'm using these silicon based nanopores um, made out of different materials such as silicon nitride or silicon dioxide. And here you can see an example of a conical nanopore in silicon dioxide membranes. So now that, that we know what nanopores are, let's understand how we use these nanopore membranes for sensing. So here is our typical nanopore membrane in which you have a silicon based frame and silicon nitride, uh, a freestanding silicon nitride membrane in which we have a nanopore. So this membrane goes in between this custom built cell. So here is our membrane as you can see and we put uh, liquid or different analyte or biomolecules in uh, either uh, either both the sides or on one side depending upon what we want to do and then we apply a bias across this uh, membrane using uh, these silver wires and which are then connected to our electronics. So what happens when we apply a bias across the membrane? So because this proteins or biomolecules are charged in nature. So the biomolecules go through the nanopore. And what we are doing is we are measuring the ionic current through that hole. So when a protein or a biomolecule passes through that hole, it occupies an area across that hole and the ions cannot pass through the nanopore during that time, which leads to a drop in ionic current, which we measure using the electronics that I will explain in a minute. So now this drop in current is characteristic of what is the shape or size of the protein. If the proteins are bigger in sh size, which means they occupy larger area of the nanopore, we will have a higher drop in ionic current. But if they are longer, which means they occupy the space or occupy the nanopore for longer time, we will have a drop for longer duration. Thus, a typical signal can be characterized by the drop in current over a different duration, depending upon what type of biomolecule there is. And this is characteristic of the protein or biomolecule that passes through the nanopore. And from that, we can judge what kind of nanopore or what kind of biomolecule or protein has passed through the nanopore. But for Having a reliable and highly sensitive biosensor, we need to have ultra thin membranes because the thinner the membrane, the more resolution we can get about the size as well as the shape of the biomolecule. These membranes need to be high lifetime. They need to be reproducible and we should be able to make stable nanopores. And lastly, we want to integrate these um, nanopore membranes with AI to identify different proteins. 
Okay, so first let's talk about membrane fabrication. Not going into much detail, but using the standard silicon fabrication uh, techniques, we could make nanopores at a wafer scale industry, industrially compatible uh, method. So we could we were able to make membranes as thin as only three nanometers. And when we make nanopores in these membranes, the effective thickness was just 1.5 nanometers. In terms of materials, we could make membranes of different materials such as silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, high K dielectrics. And for nanopore fabrication, we use two different methods, control breakdown method and track edge technology. Let's first talk about control breakdown technique. So in control breakdown technique, we take our thin membrane we put them in the cell as I showed earlier, and we apply a high voltage across the membrane. What happens when we apply high voltage across the membrane is that it leads to creation of these electron hole pair traps and defects accumulate with time. And this accumulation of traps with time leads to creation of this, uh, this hole or this pore in the membrane. And by defining what uh, is the amplitude or magnitude of the voltage applied, how, for how long we apply, we can control the shape as well as the size of the pore. And the other method, which is called the track edge technology, for this method, we used big accelerators such as the 14 UD accelerator in which we can apply, uh, uh, we can use the ions with energy less than 200 million electron volts or the one in Germany where we can apply from 500 million electron volts to 2.2 giga electron volts. So what happens is that we take our membrane as we discussed earlier, and we bombard it with very fast moving ion. When this ion passes through the membrane, it leads to a region of defects. So it creates defect along the path it passes through the membrane. So this defected region is more susceptible to different chemicals or the different agents as compared to the bulk. So the, the, the etch rate along the path of our ion is called the track etch rate. And, the, and it is represented by Vt here. And the bulk etch rate is Bv. So if the track etch rate is of few tens of or hundreds of orders of magnitude higher than the bulk edge rate, we will have a cylindrical nanopore. If it is just few times larger than the bulk edge rate, we will have a conical nanopore. And if it is variable along the path, we will have a curved conical nanopore. Thus, by changing the ratio of the track and bulk edge rate, we can change the shape of the nanopore. And we can change this ratio by changing chemical, by changing what is the ion species, by changing what are the conditions at which we achieve, as well as the composition or stoichiometry of the membrane. Also, another important thing is that we want to tune the properties of the nanopore. So first, uh, tunability or the most important tunability that we want to do is we want to change the shape of the nanopore. Now, the shape of the nanopore is very important because it translates all the pro all the properties of the nanopore membrane. It changes the factors like conductance, it changes kinetics of translocation of biomolecules, it changes rectification ratio, capture radius, flow rate, everything about the nanopore membrane. Also, as you can see here, by changing the composition of the membrane, we can change the surface properties of the nanopore. So here on top, you can see silicon nitride with a stoichiometric composition. And in the bottom, we have silicon nitride with silicon rich composition. And when so what we do is then we do um, open pore conductance versus pH, which, which translates to what is the surface properties of the membrane. And as you can see, they are completely different. So by changing the composition or stoichiometry of the membrane composition, we can change its surface properties as well. Hence, we choose a composition and a shape which gives us the most reliable, reproducible and tunable nanopore membranes. 
So earlier I showed you an animation of biomolecules passing through the nanopore, but let us see an actual um, current trace. So here you can see different, different biomolecules passing through our nanopore. So on the top, we have our, our baseline and all these drops that you can see are different, different biomolecules passing. So this is a real time trace and you can see that hundreds or thousands of biomolecules pass in a second. So then we take our trace and then we analyze it and fit it to get information of what type of biomolecules has passed through our membrane. Here you can see that some of the, these drops are shorter, longer, deeper, which then tells us that different biomolecules have passed through. But because they pass at such a high rate, uh, the biomolecules through our nanopores pass at such a high speeds that we need to do this measurement at very fast rates. So hence we have developed electronics that allows us to achieve a time resolution of only 25 nanoseconds. And thus using the fabricated ultra thin and highly stable nanopore membranes, we crossed 1 million event barrier and I'm very happy to tell you that we established a world record of highest number of biomolecules passed, passed through a single solid state nanopore membrane, which tells us that our system is quite reliable and can be used for different, different applications. Okay, let's now see how our, we, are, we, are, we want to use our membranes for uh, detection of Alzheimer's and MS. So what happens when a neuron degenerates? It leads to this neurofilaments in both blood and spinal fluid. So if we can sense these neurofilaments, then we can know that a person is can have Alzheimer's and MS. So these neurofilaments have very high concentration in spinal fluid. That's why the traditional methods, which are not as sensitive as our, as our platform, need to use spinal fluid for detection. But what we want to do is we want to detect these neurofilaments directly from blood, providing very less invasive test. But it is not very simple. So there are more than 10,500 proteins in our human body and they come in all different shapes, sizes. Hence, we can extract less number of proteins or we can have our prob problem set of only 150 proteins by depending upon the fact that some of these proteins are soluble in water, some of them are soluble in fats. Also, as you can see in this schem schematic, they come in all different shapes and sizes. So we filter them and we separate them depending upon if they are soluble in water or fats. And then we further, because the, as I mentioned earlier, that these proteins are charged in nature. So depending upon their charge, isoelectric points and things like that, we have our problem set of 40 proteins. But that is also not as simple as that. So although always what we want is that when the protein or biomolecule passes through our uh, membrane, it gives us a smooth translocation. But because these proteins are have complex structures, they lead to different signals depending upon which orientation they pass through the nanopore. They can get adsorbed on the nanopore surface, which will give us a completely different signal. They can tumble through, again, completely different signal as well as they can unfold, which will give a completely different signal as compared to other protein, other smooth translocations. Hence, we integrate our system with AI to identify what is the type of uh, biomolecule present in a complex solution. So this, this process is a three-step process. So we first develop algorithms to differentiate between different proteins. And then these algorithms are trained with data originating from each protein as well as mixture of different proteins. Then so that the pro so that the algorithm can know that if this type of protein has passed through 
this membrane it can interact in this way it gives this type of signal and things like that and then we use these uh, developed algorithms to identify the presence and concentration of these neurofilaments in blood so we are not there yet we have not trained all the 40 uh, proteins in our problem set but i will show you what we have done till now so as an example we have first taken a binary system in which we have two proteins in which is bsa and cone and these are the the signals originating from these proteins as you can see the signals are so similar to each other that if i take a single signal of 10000 signals and ask a human does it belong to bsa or does it belong to cone a human cannot tell the difference but using our algorithms that we have trained, we were able to detect with 92% certainty. Then we went to a quaternary uh, system in which we take very, very complex proteins which with very similar shape as well as size as well as molecular weights. And here are the four proteins that we have considered. And then we use our uh, algorithms to tell us that if we have a, a, a system of two different proteins or three different proteins or four different proteins, can it tell us if, if a specific protein belongs to this, if a specific signal belongs to this protein or not? And even with when we had a quaternary system of such closely sized and uh, molecular weight proteins, we, would, we could tell with more than 79% certainty if a protein will if a signal belongs to this protein or a different protein so we have achieved quite promising results but we will still be working towards training more and more um, signals originating from different different proteins and then we will be aiming for detection of these neurofilaments directly from blood with that i would like to thank our collaborators this this is my group um, which is advanced uh, materials group and i would like to acknowledge all of our collaborators from germany from the australian synchrotron in 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 melbourne and with that i would like to thank you for your kind attention and i'm happy to take any questions Uh, really fascinating presentations. I, we have now an opportunity for Q and A with our presenters. So, we have one question that's been submitted in chat so far for uh, for Shankar, and it comes from um, from Susan. Uh, Susan's question is: Do you think your technology will be able to detect tau protein in blood? Yes, so uh, tau protein is also one of the proteins of uh, interest for us. Um, we are also working on uh, basically detecting multiple proteins at once, so presence of multiple proteins, which will increase the specificity of the detector. Also, another advantage of that is because sometimes, um, especially let's as an example of NFL, it one single biomarker can be a uh, uh, can. Be, so a single protein can be a biomarker of multiple diseases. So detecting multiple biomarkers at once um, can help us in that regime as well. Mm, thank you. I hope that, that answer makes sense to you, Susan. It probably makes more sense to you than it does to me, but thank you. Thanks, Shankar. I, I, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, one is possibly a simple one, and, and that is, are you guaranteed because of the dimensions of the nanopore that only one molecule at a time passes yes, through? So, yeah, so as, as I showed in the presentations, we can really control the shape and size of the, uh, of the nanopore. So we have tested this um, as well. So uh, for example, if we have, let's say two proteins, one with size of six nanometers, another one with three nanometers, so we will try to make to try to design our nanopore of let's say four nanometers only okay. that okay. protein goes through. But sometimes it happens that multiple proteins go through, especially this is a, 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 a thing uh, happens with DNA in which when we try to measure DNA with larger size nanopore, so it 
passes through as it is, which is single stranded, and then sometimes it folds. But that is also one of the things that we are interested in teaching our algorithms so that it can learn that if it passes in that way, this will be the shape so, of the yeah signal. So I guess that thank you, and that 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 uh, segues nicely to my second question, which you can either take as a comment or a question. Uh, I've, I'm I'm amazed that given the the orientation, the opportunity for absorb adsorption, the tumbling, the unfolding, I'm amazed that you can do identification. It doesn't seem to be that there's a signature. It seems there are so many variables that would would confound a, a, a decision on which particular protein has been observed passing through the nanopore. You able to comment on that? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I didn't go into much detail given the time constraints of the presentation. So we, we do not put the raw uh, signal that I showed as an input for um, for the our signal. So there are a lot of things uh, that go into the input for learning. For example, one of the things in which, um, especially for these interactions with the nanopores or unfolding, so, um, one of the things that we do is that we um, pre-filter the signals or we cluster the signals into different parts. Then we uh, use things like kurtosis or the skewness of the shape of the signal and things like that. So we do not, so actually it was uh, just to tell you uh, uh, in terms of accuracies. So if you put a raw signal, we have accuracies only 32%, but using these strategies, we could get to this high percentage. So yeah, 32% with like, you know, that's just random. So yeah, yeah. I hope it answers your question. Yeah, it, look, it does. Actually, I, and I, uh, I guess another comment rather than a question, but I think it's fascinating that uh, here you are a physicist uh, using, looking for biomolecules and using artificial intelligence to uh, do the identification. I, it's, it's, uh, it's a very diverse PhD project. Well, thanks a lot for that. I mean, uh, just to <laughs> say one thing, COVID has to blame for this. So because COVID happened, we were not able to use the heavy iron accelerator facility. So I had to focus my PhD into this field. <laughs> well, I think it's it's paid dividends. Look, uh, it falls to me now to introduce our next three speakers. And they are each PhD research candidates who have been awarded Royal Society of New South Wales scholarships for 2022. There are three of them. I'll introduce each of them in turn and, and then the video will, will play uh, a short presentation by, by each. Our first presenter this, this evening is Miss Clara Liu Chung Ming. Uh, who will be speaking to us on a novel hope for heart failure patients using bioengineered heart tissues. Clara's a PhD candidate in the School of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Technology, Sydney. She undertook her bachelor study at the University of Melbourne, majoring in neuroscience and her master of philosophy in medical biotechnology at UTS in 2020. Her current research focuses on the bioengineering of advanced 3D in vitro models of human heart pathophysiology, including what she's called a so-called heart attack in a Petri dish, which she'll be speaking about tonight, which is both fascinating and terrifying in equal measure. Our second presenter this evening is Thomas Masalio, who will be presenting a present to us on um, uh, uh, the title of his presentation is Say Cheese Tree, Exploring Australia's Vascular Plant Photographic Record. Thomas is a PhD candidate at UNSW Sydney, working on our understanding of Australian plants and how to improve this knowledge. He's a curator and forum moderator on the global diversity citizen science platform, iNaturalist, and has contributed more than 237,000 identifications and 40,000 observations to the site. Really a truly remarkable achievement. Our third presenter this evening is Miss Anya Zhao, who will be presenting on the molecular mechanism of listeria of an ovi-induced inflammasome activation. And Anya graduated with a Bachelor of Philosophy in Science at the Australian National University 
In 2021, she completed her honours research year in the John Curtin School of Medical Research and achieved the top mark for her honours cohort. Anya has already published a preview article in Cell, Host and Microbe as a co-first author and has further co-authored two primary research articles published in Science Immunology and Nature Communications all during the first year of her PhD studies. Truly remarkable achievements from all three uh, winners of the Royal Society of New South Wales scholarships for 2022 and I congratulate all of them. Hi everyone, my name is Clara and today I will be talking about a new hope for heart failure patients using bioengineer heart tissues. So cardiovascular disease is the greatest cause of death worldwide and this leads to one third of all death. Myocardial infarction, also known as heart attack, occurs when blood flow decreases or stops the part of the heart causing damage to the heart muscle. The effective therapeutic intervention is immediate myocardial reperfusion, such as percutaneous coronary intervention by restoring blood flow and prevent extensive oxygen depletion to the muscle wall. However, this causes a second wave of injury known as ischemic reperfusion injury, and this leads to prolonged hypoxia and cardiac cell death. And this is an irreversible damage leading to chronic heart failure. Another leading cause of death is cancer, and doxorubicin is a common chemotherapy drug used to treat breast cancer, bladder cancer, lymphoma, and leukemia. However, these drugs, even after 17 years after the treatment, causes cardiotoxicity, which leads to severe cardiomyopathy and heart failure. So current treatment for heart failure patients are palliative drugs and mechanical assist devices. However, those current treatments are limited and only delays the progression of heart failure and the heart tissue cannot regenerate and the gold standard treatment remains heart transplant. We are currently research to try new approaches to regenerate the heart using tissue engineering and regenerative medicine such as cell therapy and cell-free therapy. So over the years, researchers have found that nerves play a critical role in guiding the regenerative processes in the injured heart in multiple species such as zebrafish, mice, canine, and swan. And nerve produces neurochemicals to communicate between each other and organs, and a common one is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine usually regulates the heart rate and contractility of the heart. So what if acetylcholine can also benefit the human damaged heart? As current models such as 2D culture and animal model fail to fully recapitulate the complex scenario of human physiology and pathophysiology, Researchers are trying to find new ways to replicate human physiology using 3D human culture, also known as bioengineer heart tissue, and there are different types such as engineer heart tissue, cell sheets, organoids, and ferroid culture, microfluidic devices, and 3D bioprinted cardiac tissues. Our lab has developed a mini heart model known as cardiac pheroids, which is made up of the three main cell types in the heart, known as cardiomyocytes, fibroblasts, and endothelium cells, and it has shown to better mimic the human microenvironment and replicate human heart pathophysiology, and also have shown to have vascular network formation. So using the mini heart model, we induce heart attack in a petri dish. And the results have shown that by inducing heart attack, there is a decrease in the viability of cells as well as an increase in cell death. And by treating the heart attack in a petri dish with acetylcholine, we see that it restores cell viability and attenuates cell death. 
also by inducing doxorubicin to mimic heart failure? The results have shown that there is a significant decrease in cell viability as well as an increase in cell death. And by treating with acetylcholine, we see that there is an increase in the viability of cells and a significant decrease in cell death. So looking at the contractility of a mini heart model, which is on the left side, and by inducing heart attack in a petri dish in the mini heart model, there is a significant decrease in the contractile function of a mini heart. By treating it with acetylcholine, we see that it, it attenuates the effect of heart attack in a petri dish in the contractile function. And by inducing doxorubicin to mimic heart failure, the results have shown that in the mini heart, there is a significant decrease in the contractile function of a mini heart. And by treating it with acetylcholine, we see that the, the contractile function is restored. As you can see, the thyroid is beating. As our mini heart model consists of three main cell types, which is cardiomyocytes, which function is for the contractility of a heart, and the VM cells, which is for the vascular network for blood flow, and fibroblasts is to stretch the muscle wall as well as maintain the microenvironment of a heart, and by inducing heart attack in a petri dish, the results have shown that there is a significant increase in cell death for cardiomyocytes and fibroblasts, and that acetylcholine attenuates cell death for fibroblasts, which means that it can lead to a decrease of a stiffening of a heart, as well as maintain cardiac function of a mini heart model. So in the mini heart model, by inducing doxorubicin to mimic heart failure, the results have shown that there is a significant decrease for all cell types. And by treating it with acetylcholine, it attenuates the effect of cell death for all cell types. So in summary, mini heart model can mimic heart attack in a petri dish and doxorubicin induce heart failure. And acetylcholine can be a promising target to treat and prevent heart attack and doxorubicin induce heart failure with a potential to save millions of lives in Australia and globally. However, more studies need to be done. I would like to specially thank my main supervisor, Kominé Chantil, as well as my other co-supervisors and my research team. And I'm also working alongside Dr. Lana McClements and Christine McGrath on a pre project, which is we are taking blood from um, women who have pre after 17 years, uh, after five years of giving birth, and we are reprogramming those blood cells into stem cells and then to cardiomyocytes and endothelium cells to make our mini heart model so that we can better understand the correlation between preeclampsia and cardiovascular disease and its implications implication and underlying disease mechanism. Also, I'm working with Matt Johansson and Phil Hansbrough on the effect of COVID-19 using our mini heart model. Thank you for listening. Feel free to ask any question. My name's Thomas Mazzaglio, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of New South Wales. This talk covers a research project that I worked on last year, 
that was recently published in the journal New Phytologist. When it comes to biodiversity data, physical specimens are the gold standard and will always be irreplaceable. But there is an increasing recognition of the value of photographic vouchers as well. Photographs of plants in the field allow researchers to more effectively sample very large organisms, such as trees, or groups like cacti that may be difficult to collect. They're also really important for recording features that are often lost over time in physical specimens, such as flower colour, and they provide greater ecological context for the subject in focus. Ideally, the two get combined. You take photographs of a plant and then collect it. Photos are also crucial outside the world of specimens and taxonomy. They provide invaluable reference material for field identification, which is crucial for ecologists, land managers, and conservationists, and they're the building blocks of field guides and identification keys. Perhaps most importantly, Photographs of plants serve as an important bridge between botanists and the general public and help enthuse the latter about the botanical world. Australia has one of the richest floras of any country, so we were interested in how well photographed it actually is. This was a multi-stage process. First, we downloaded a complete list of all known Australian vascular plants from the Australian Plant Census, which is an online database informing which scientific names are currently accepted and where these species are distributed. We removed all species that are not native to at least one Australian state or territory, as well as any entities that weren't at the level of species. This gave us a master species list of just over 21,000 native Australian vascular plant species described as of 2018. From here, we conducted a census of 33 major online photographic repositories and databases. The large majority of these were resources created and maintained by professional botanists and taxonomists, such as identification keys and herbarium websites, but we also surveyed some major citizen science platforms, such as iNaturalist. To be ticked off our list, an image had to be a photograph of a live plant in the field taken somewhere in Australia and had to show a recognisable part of the plant. Across these 21,000 species, almost 4,000 did not have a photograph of a live plant in any of the 33 online resources, which is a surprisingly high number. The most unphotographed genus was actually acacia, the wattles, with almost 100 species still yet to be photographed in the field. However, this is a little bit deceptive because Australia is also, I should say, acacia is also Australia's most diverse genus by a significant margin with more than 1,000 described species. So it's actually pretty well documented in relative terms. If we look at a family breakdown, grasses come out on top as the most unphotographed, with native peas, which includes wattles, in hot pursuit. But why are some groups so well documented, whilst others have hundreds of species yet to be photographed? There are three main driving factors. The first relates to plant charisma. Most of the well-photographed plant groups tend to be large shrubs or trees and have spectacular floral displays. Case in point, Banksia, one of the most recognisable Australian plant genera with amazing inflorescences. And in fact, it's one of only two Australian plant genera with more than 40 species that are 100% photographed. On the flip side of that coin, and I apologise to any grass enthusiasts that are tuning in, plant groups like grasses or sedges tend to be poorly photographed, as they're often small in stature, have fairly innocuous looking flowers, and are generally less noticeable than other plants. This last point, detectability, is a really important one. 
many unphotographed plants are small herbs or grasses that are ephemeral in both space and time. Flowering or appearing above ground only during specific environmental conditions or only for a short period of time, which makes photographing them even more of a challenge. In some cases, some plants are really hard or even impossible to identify from photographs. So some of these species may well have been photographed, but the images just haven't been identified yet because the important features aren't visible. There can also be a disincentive to photograph these plants in the first place. If I'm out on a walk and I come across a sedge like Lepidosperma, I often won't even bother taking photos because I know it will be so difficult to identify them anyway without collecting a specimen. There are also some clear spatial biases in the data. Now this map shows where species have been photographed. The percentage is how complete the species in that state or territory are, and the number in parentheses is the total number of species recorded for that state. As you can immediately see, southeastern Australia is very well documented, with pretty much every state and territory reaching or exceeding 95% of their species photographed, whilst Western Australia, Northern Territory, and Queensland are where the bulk of the missing species are distributed. And this pattern manifests really clearly in this figure, which is a heat map of where the unphotographed species are in Australia. Straight away, you can see three major hotspots. Northern Australia, spanning from the Kimberley to Arnhem Land, Queensland's Wet Tropics World Heritage Area, and southwestern Western Australia, especially the Stirling Range and Fitzgerald River National Park. All three of these regions are united by their remoteness, vast areas of wilderness, and often difficult accessibility. You can really visualize this with this photo I took in the Stirling Range in Western Australia last year. Pretty rugged terrain, so you can understand why there are so many unphotographed species here. Perhaps the most surprising and unintuitive finding was that there's a strong bias towards recently described species being unphotographed. Why is this the case in an era where digital photography has become significantly cheaper and more accessible? In a lot of cases, new plant species are actually described from pressed specimens in herbaria that were collected decades ago, so the taxonomists may not have actually ever seen those species in the field. In other cases, photos do indeed exist, but they're not in any of the major online databases. These photographs may be slides in someone's desk drawer or hard drive somewhere, appear in possibly out of print books or field guides, or be behind paywalls in the scientific literature. This lack of discoverability and accessibility is a major problem because these photos are very unlikely to be found by someone in the field trying to identify these species. But how do we stack up against the rest of the world? There's only been a single other analysis like ours, a 2021 study by Pittman et al. that focused on the Americas. The USA and Canada were well documented with over 90% of species photographed, on par with southeastern Australia. But those two countries combined have thousands of fewer species than Australia. If we look instead at the three most plant-rich regions from the Americas, the countries with more than 20,000 vascular plant species like Australia, they were relatively poorly documented, with barely more than half of their species photographed. Now, in the 10 months or so since we completed our analysis, almost 10% of those 3,700 unphotographed species have since had photographs uploaded online. As one example, the plant on the slide here is the daisy bush Oliaria eremea. First described in 1990, it's only found in the arid desert interior of Western Australia. It remained unphotographed for more than 30 years until last year when I found a small population on a rocky outcrop at Yo Lake Nature Reserve, more than 1,000 kilometers inland from Perth. So how can you help? 
The QR code on the slide here will take you to a spreadsheet of every unphotographed plant in Australia with information on where you can find them. Almost 150 of these species are currently listed as vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. So it's very possible that some of them may go extinct without ever being photographed in the field. So head out there into the wilderness and find some of these unphotographed plants and help document them. What are you waiting for? Good evening, everyone. My name is Anya. It's very nice to meet you all via Zoom. I'm a PhD student in the Australian National University. It's my great honor to present my work to you. Yeah. Today, I will present my work for in my honors and my first year of PhD which titled Molecular Mechanisms of Listeria Ivanovia Induced Inflammasome Activation. First, let me briefly introduce Listeria Ivanovia. Listeria Ivanovia is a row-shaped gram-positive bacterium which can be found in a variety of environmental sources, including soil, water, and animal feces. Listeria Ivanovia is a major source of food contamination which is the one of the two uh, pathogenic species in the Listeria genus. When a patient consumed with L. avanovii, the bacteria can invade their stomach and small intestine to cause gastroenteritis. L. avanovii can further into the, enter the bloodstream to cause bacteremia, which leads to sepsis and abortion. A previous screening experiment conducted in our lab suggested that l avanovia activates a host defense system known as the inflammasome. The inflammasome is a cytosolic micromolecular innate immune signaling complex, which consists of three main components. Inflammasome sensor, adapter protein ASC, and effector protein caspase-1. The inflammasome sensor detects pathogen and danger-associated molecular patterns. And once activated, the inflammasome promotes an inflammatory form of cell death known as paraptosis, as well as mediates the secretion of inflammatory cytokines to cause inflammation. Based on our background knowledge, I hypothesized that in response to l avanovia infection, the inflammasome induces inflammation, cell death, and host mortality. In order to test my hypothesis, I developed two aims. The first aim is to identify the inflammasome sensor activated by l avanovia infection. The second aim is to elucidate the role of phagocytosis and cytosolic escape in l avanovia induced inflammasome activation. I used multiple experimental approaches to study my aim. Bone marrow-derived microphages, or BMDNs, has been used as a model for this study because it consists of all the components of the inflammasome. When an inflammasome sensor has been activated, caspase 1 will be recruited for autocleavage and activation. Activated caspase 1 can further cleave gastermin D into its own terminal. The cleavage of caspase 1 and gastermin D can be analyzed using immunoblotting assay. The active gastermin D will bind to the cell membrane and induce an inflammatory form of cell death known as paraptosis, which can be visualized under microscopy. Caspase 1 can further cleave inflammatory cytokines, IL-1 beta and IL-18, into their active form, which can be secreted out of the cells and quantified using ELISA. The first question I want to answer is, which inflammasome is activated by l avanovia infection? In order to study this, I infect l avanovia with a panel of microphages lacking different inflammasome components. The results suggest that l avanovia can induce a P20 band for caspase 1 and a P30 band for gastermin D in wild-type microphages, suggesting inflammasome activation. However, 
These bands are absent in N2 knockout, ASC knockout, and caspase one knockout macrophages, suggesting these three components, which forms the N2 inflammasome, is required in l Ivanovian activation. My result is further supported by my cytokine data, where l Ivanovia can induce high level of IL-1 beta and IL-18 in wild-time macrophages. However, in N2 knockout, ASC knockout, and caspase one knockout macrophages, the inflammatory cytokine level is very low. Altogether, these results suggested that l Ivanovia activates the N2 inflammasome to induce the secretion of IL-1 beta and IL-18. When l Ivanovia infects a cell, first, you will undergo phagocytosis to be contained in a phagosome. In order to study whether this process is required for inflammasome activation, I used a phagocytosis inhibitor known as latron B. The results suggest, with absence of latron B, l Ivanovia induced a P20 band for caspase 1 and a P30 band for gastamin D. However, the bands are absent with presence of this inhibitor. In this experiment, I use salmonella typhimurin as a positive control and a bacterial toxin nigerosin as a negative control. Again, my results are supported by the cytokine data. l Ivanovia only induce high level of IL-1 beta and IL-18 with absence of latron B. Altogether, these results suggested that l Ivanovia require phagocytosis to induce inflammasome activation. After phagocytosis, l Ivanovia will mediate phagosomal rupture and gain access to the cytoplasm. In order to study whether this process is required for inflammasome activation, I used a mutant of Listeria Ivanovia called the PRFA knockout. This mutant do not have the ability to gain cytosolic access. The results suggest that wild-type l Ivanovia can induce inflammasome activation, while the PRFA mutant cannot. I further confirm the result using electron microscopy. For scanning electron microscopy, we can see that untreated cells has intact cell membrane and extensive ruffle, suggesting the cell is under a healthy condition. However, for cells treated with l Ivanovia, we can see the cell is completely blast open which is the morphology of paraptosis. And we can see many bacteria inside and outside the cell. For cells treated with l Ivanovia PRFA mutant, however, this, despite the presence of the bacteria, the cells are still intact with extensive rubble. For transmission electron microscopy, untreated cells has little vacuole and distinct cellular structures. For cells treated with l Ivanovia, however, we can see many vacuoles forming inside the cell, engulfing everything, including all the cellular structures, which indicates paraptosis. For cells treated with l Ivanovia PRFA mutant, despite the presence of the bacteria, we can still only see little vacuole, and the cellular structures are still distinct within cells. Altogether, these results suggested that l Ivanovia requires cytosolic access to induce inflammasome activation. In summary, my work had shown that l Ivanovia requires phagocytosis, cytosolic access to induce N2 inflammasome activation. After N2 inflammasome activation, inflammatory cytokines pro-IL1 beta and pro-IL18 will be cleaved into the active form which can be secreted out of cells to cause inflammation and cell death. In the end, my work had addressed the knowledge gap on the role of DNA sensing in the immune defense against pathogens, which might provide novel insights into DNA sensing mechanisms in other diseases such as cancer and autoimmunity, and may lead to development of immunotherapies and other vaccines. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to my talk, and thanks to Royal Society of New South Wales to provide me this scholarship. As a medical researcher, I really hope my work or our work can lead to novel therapies to treat 
infectious diseases and cancer, which give us a better future. Thank you very much. So what I'll do is now I'll now open up for questions for, uh, for Thomas, for Clara and Anya. Another question about uh, uh, the translation of the, if this is for Clara, the translation of the use of acetylcholine to, the, to, to a clinical setting. Yes. Oh, that's a great uh, question, Suzanne. Thank you. So I know that acetylcholine is very controversial among cardiology, uh, cardiologists because it's used to detect coronary spasm. However, um, this is used at, at a high dose. And what we are using, it's very low. It's one tenth of what we are using. And also, um, while doing my PhD right now, we are focusing on using nanoparticles. So we are collaborating with Professor Xiaowei Wan from the Baker Heart Institute from Melbourne. And she and her team is creating nanoparticle that's containing acetylcholine for us. And that will help us to target the injured part to reduce the acetylcholine in humans. Thank but, you. But also for the scare, uh, scoring for the mini heart. So we have tested on the fibrosis, which cause the scoring, but yes, and we have found like we can detect fibrosis in the mini heart model. Thank you. I think there's, is there another question? No, so that's for, there's a question for Anya. So the, the next question I have on my list is for Thomas. And I see Thomas, you've answered it in, 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 in the webinar chat, but if you could maybe answer for the broader audience. How, uh, the question is, how does knowledge held by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people help your research? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as a lot of people would be aware, a lot of traditional uh, Australian Indigenous knowledge is passed down orally, so not necessarily uh, written down or recorded with things like photographs, uh, but they do have a really critical role to play. So a lot of these particularly remote areas that are Indigenous protected areas, so this is in areas like Arnhem Land uh, or the Kimberley, so a lot of areas in particular in Western Australia and the Northern Territory, where the Indigenous people there have this intimate knowledge of the land and in a lot of cases know where these really rare plants are uh, that Western scientists may not have seen for 5, 10, 20 years uh, and may not actually know whether they're, they're extinct or not or whether they're still around. So if we're able to collaborate with those communities uh, and have them show us where the plants are, um, a lot of them are unphotographed. Uh, and so then that would be a massive help for being able to get images of those species. Mm, thank you. Uh, that, that leads nicely onto a question that has been posted in the Q&A, which, which I'll read out for you, Thomas. It's, uh, um, it's, it's the issue of uh, ha, ha, it, it's something about popper's, popper's swans. How do we know we've seen them all? How do you know 100% have been photographed? How, how do you know what fraction you have seen or photographed? Yeah, so it's, it's a really tricky case with, with you know, a number of things. Obviously, there are constantly new species being discovered uh, as well. Um, so, so one thing we did, we just, you know, we set largely a, a set of ground rules. So it was, we, we cut things off anything described 2018 beforehand. Uh, and largely those 33 databases we selected, we pick them based on uh, how verifiable the images are essentially. So one thing that I mentioned was that we picked a mostly professional resources. So a lot of the photographs that we have essentially ticked off species for, a lot of them are associated with vouchered specimens. Um, so the photographs do actually represent individual plants that have been collected, they're being stored in a herbarium, and they've been identified by a professional botanist or taxonomist um, who, of course, still make mistakes, uh, just like anyone does, uh, but obviously at a much lower rate uh, than, say, more amateur naturalists. So, yeah, I'll, 
certainly probably the, some of the species in our data set uh, that we have ticked off as being photographed probably haven't been uh, because they're misidentified, but that would be a exceedingly small percentage, I would say, of the of the mm -hmm. total number. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And there's one more for Thomas before we turn to uh, Anya. And that is, it's a, it's a comment from, from Jessica Milner Davis, who writes, can you please share the QR code with participants in a way that we can save it on our devices or point us to a website which has it. I have colleagues in remote sanctuaries in two of the regions you are keen to focus on in adding photos and I'd happily share it with them if they don't already know about your project. So there's an opportunity to, and I'm sure we can get that that QR code circulated more widely. Yeah, I, I can send you guys just a direct link as well. So that, that would be absolutely fantastic, Jessica. We'd be much appreciated. Thanks, Thomas. Our, uh, our next question we have is a question from Peter Bone for Anya. What time frame do you envisage before clinically useful techniques from your research are available to treating people? Thank you. So thank you for your question. So. Uh, for my research, I'm kind of doing the fundamental research of the basic of the medis, uh, of the either medical or human biology or the disease of the pathogenicities of yeah of, of of the medicine thing. So I think for my work, which uh, to become uh, applicable in the clinical settings, either I need to build up on my work or I am I and other people who's in the field all need to build up on my work. I will uh, think the time frame to be to get my work to be uh, applicable probably takes 10 to 20 years because right. when it goes into medicine, we always want to be really, really careful. To be, uh, for example, if we get a new drug, for the discovery of the drug until it can be used in patient, the clinical trials can take to up to 12 years already. So for my very fundamental work, go into application, I probably will expect 10 to 12, 20 years. Just, wow. yeah, we need to be very careful for medical work because wow. we need to use on people. Yeah. So the, the a, a, a related question then, probably from Susan again, uh, uh, for you, Anya, what do you envisage will be the targets of the vaccines that you're suggesting? Um, I think this, from my understanding, uh, this question is probably not very accurate, but it's somehow related. So I am proposed to, uh, in the very end, I am proposed like lots of uh, possible use of listeria. I'm proposing to use listeria as one of the ways to deliver vaccines rather than serve as a vaccine targets. Uh -huh. So there are some interesting features of the listeria. Uh, for example, it can go into cells by itself. Second, it's targeted by the immune system. And third, uh, for listeria, there are some strains that is not very pathogenic. So we can use this non-pathogenic listeria, which do not cause disease, we can use it as a transportation of our vaccine. So we can transport our vaccine targets onto our immune system. So our immune system can see the target and the immune system will be boost and react to the target we want to react on. So that's Wonderful. the thing I'm proposed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anya. Uh, that's all the questions we have in the Q&A. So if there are no more questions, I propose to, uh, to offer a vote, of, uh, a vote of thanks to our, to our speakers. And I will begin by thanking each of our speakers, Shankar, uh, Thomas, Anya and Clara. Uh, thanks so much for your presentations. Congratulations to all of you for for your remarkable, uh, not just contributions, but your ability to communicate to, to an interested audience. Um, quite, uh, quite, quite remarkable in my view.